when language gets weird after narcissistic abuse. Do you know what it's like for a parent to yell at you consistently, then tell you they love you later in the day? Were you required to tell your parent that you love them even though you secretly knew you didn't feel that way towards them? And did you see your parent extol your virtues to people outside the family, then belittle or berate you behind closed doors? Well, if you're familiar with any of these experiences, then today's video may be useful. A narcissistic parent's moods and attitudes towards their child can vacillate wildly if the child happens to be adding to the parent's artificially inflated sense of self-worth, then they may be the apple of that parent's eye in that moment. But conversely, if the child is trying to exercise his or her independence and then therefore threatens the parent's sense of domination over that child, then that same child may be met with scorn and devaluation. So it can be incredibly difficult to make sense of, and I think at a deep level, for the child in this situation. In today's video, I'm gonna describe some of the language traps that the child of the narcissistic parent may find themselves in. Namely, trying to make coherent the fact that the same person the child depends on as a frame of reference for what's true, their parent, says, I love you one moment, then screams or yells or berates the child the next. That one of the consequences of such really duplicitous communication is that the child can learn that language just doesn't mean that much. And I'll explain how. And last, I'll discuss a resource to help you restore your faith and investment in the power of language. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California who specializes in helping people recover from narcissistic abuse. And this form of abuse can leave folks feeling lost and estranged from their sense of who they are. And in individual therapy and through my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse, I try to offer a map that allows um, those in recovery to come back to the quality of life that they know they deserve. And although each survivor must travel this path themselves, I think a map can be tremendously helpful uh, to do this with. And there are three features on the map that I refer to as the three pillars to recovery. The first is making sense of what happened. Um, in essence, to know that this abuse was not your fault. The second is to gain, whether it's physical, emotional, or psychological distance from the narcissistic abuser. And the third pillar is to live in defiance of the narcissist rules. And lastly, but importantly, you can't do this in a vacuum. I think it's essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. And today's video, I want to say, falls under pillar number three, making sense of what happened. And as, as always, um, all the videos I post here have been organized into a playlist that corresponds to one of these three pillars. Um, so you can find other videos that um, also uh, address the pillar of making sense of what happened uh, if you look at the playlist and the same for the other pillars. Well, if you also happen to be a scapegoat survivor of a narcissistic parent or partner, then I, I would encourage you to check out my free ebook on the topic. It's called Surviving Narcissistic Abuse as a Scapegoat, and it goes into other important aspects of what it's like to be in the shoes of the scapegoat child or partner with a narcissistic abuser. Whether it's self-limiting beliefs about yourself that you had to adopt to survive, or why the narcissistic personality is so geared to put those closest to them down. I think this ebook can help you realize how none of this abuse was your fault, but was rather the product of the narcissist's own psychological and emotional problems. And you can find the link to the book in the description box below or by clicking here. So the power of language and how and why it can go away. Well, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy, and one of my favorite comics is this guy named Nate Bargatsky. Uh, I might be messing up his last name. Apologies, Nate. On one of his recent podcasts, he and his um, comic friends were discussing language and particularly the seeming arbitrariness of, of sort of society that, that claims some words are bad words or curse words while others are not. And, and one of the other comics said something like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we all just decided that no words were bad? And I think Nate himself made this really compelling point that, you know, if we're going to have words that mean something good, like I love you, um, then we have to have words that mean something bad. For instance, like, I hate you. Otherwise, the good words don't mean anything. And I thought this was such a compelling point, 
and one that children of narcissistic parents often miss out on. Because when you have a parent whose self-esteem is volatile and will go to any lengths to secure a sense of superiority, then what comes out of their mouths to you can get real confusing. So when the parent is feeling good, the child is likely to hear nice things about themselves. About the, the child's going to hear nice things about him or herself. And then when the parent is feeling bad, the child's likely going to hear a lot of hurtful and cruel things about who the child is. And as one trauma theorist puts it, you know, emotional abuse or abuse is not a monolith. Well, that's just a sort of way of saying it's not doesn't look the same all the time. Um, there's bound to be some good moments amidst the abuse, and it's more like a mosaic that you get the overarching theme of when you kind of take a step back and look at. So when a kid desperately wants to believe in the goodness of a narcissistic parent, and that parent acts in very contradictory ways, then language can get extremely weird for that child. And I think language gets weird because the child is hearing something like, I love you, from the same person who has said, and likely will say again, something like, or has behaved to reflect a sentiment like, I hate you. And if language is then to be taken seriously by the child, then the scenario does not make sense. And I think the word love at its core means something like feeling protected, welcomed, appreciated, uh, accepted, and safe. And getting to feel that those ways consistently, not like all the time, but consistently enough with the same person. But the child of a pathologically narcissistic parent knows not to expect such consistency. So if the narcissistic parent says, I love you, but the child knows that they feel on edge around that parent and that later or earlier in that same day, the parent has acted as if they wish the child had never been born, then what happens to the word love in the child's mind when the narcissistic, narcissistic parent you know, tells the child that that parent loves the child? At that point, the word love um, has to be used in ways that betray the child, I think in a, again, a deep way. Instead of using la language to name what the child experiences and then honestly communicate that, you know, what the child's experiencing to others, um, and also to use language to receive other sort of honest communications, language instead becomes a means towards the end of keeping the narcissistic parent pleased or keeping their, that parent's self-esteem boosted. In this case, then, the word love is stripped from the feelings of consistent protection and safety with someone else to the, something like, a meaning like, the other person is happy with me at the moment because they feel good about themselves. So this is just to illustrate another way that language can get warped for the child of a narcissistic parent where that parent's using language in very contradictory um, in kind of self-serving ways. And another way that language can get weird during and after narcissistic abuse is in how the child has to use language within themselves to excuse the narcissistic parent's cruelty towards them. When the parent acts with cruelty, is domineering, intrusive, and or vindictive, then the child has to figure out a way to not take prolonged or genuine offense to this form of treatment. So often a child can do this by not assigning the correct words to the parent's behavior. So the narcissistic mother may get a look of murderous rage in her eyes and scream at her daughter for, say, leaving her toys out, but the daughter may not say, Mom is being mean right now. The daughter may, say, may not say that to herself. Instead, the daughter may use language to focus on what she, the daughter, has supposedly done. So speaking words to herself like, I was a terrible daughter for leaving my toys out. I am so bad. Um, and, and, but also not apply words to describe her mother in those same moments. And in these ways, there's no language within the daughter that records the mother's bad moments or bad behavior. And this can help the daughter deal with the contradiction between the daughter's desire to apply the word love to a mother that and by that meaning a mother loves me and I love my mother, um, but having to or wanting to apply that word and concept um, to the same person in this case who treats the daughter so hatefully at times. Yet the cost is that the daughter will likely have a sense that language or words no longer are being used to discover, name, and then communicate truth. 
In this way, language's fundamental purpose is getting frayed because of unsolvable contradictions being presented to the child by the narcissistic parent. So there's a no-win situation of the child with the narcissistic parent, particularly when it comes to language. In these situations where a narcissistic parent says things or acts in ways that are favorable towards the child, then I want to kind of lay out how a certain dialogue can occur as the child tries to make sense of this. The narcissistic parent says something like, I love you, child. And the child thinks to themselves, okay, my parent seems to hate me and is saying they love me right now. I must be wrong to think they hate me. I am crazy and they must really love me. Or the child can think to themselves, well, my parent hates me and is saying they love me right now. They, my parent, must be crazy. Well, of course, neither of these scenarios work for a child, but it's the first one that has to be adopted. The child just cannot survive without the hope, at least, that their parent is there for them. To acknowledge that it's the parent who's misusing language, not the child, or sort of being the crazy one, would be to know that the child has no one there for them. How to recover the power of language. I think an important way to recover and use language in the way it was meant to be used is to find relationships where it is safe to know and express what you really think. And if your use of language has had to be compromised recently, then it may be especially important to seek therapy. Because in therapy, you can both process what it was like to have to surrender your use of language in order to survive a narcissistic parent, and then also practice using language as it was intended in the therapy itself. And if you are a therapist or you're interested in how the process of therapy works for survivors of narcissistic abuse, then I would like to point you towards a new ebook that I've created just for this purpose. It's called A Treatment for Survivors of Narcissistic Abuse That Works, The Basics of Control Mastery Theory. And in it, I offer a five-step process to formulate the cases of survivors of narcissistic abuse, how to help such clients feel safe in and out of the session, how to attune to and promote your client's own efforts to heal from narcissistic abuse, and finally, how such clients' real problem, as it were, is the belief that there's something wrong with them, not the actuality. And you can find the ebook in the description box below or by clicking here. Well, I hope you found today's video useful. And I want to thank everyone for your continued support and engagement uh, with the channel in the comments section. As, as I mentioned before, every week to just read um, you know, what some of the content has meant to people in their own lives, um, what you've, again, agreed with, disagreed with, um, what, what you would add to um, certain points that are made and, and points each other are making. I just, um, it's really meaningful to, to read. Um, and it's, it's great to see. And it really seems like there's a lot of momentum that's kind of built about kind of reestablishing a new orientation to reality after getting through um, narcissistic abuse and having a community where that's kind of happening and is kind of um, a very, it seems to me, a live community. Um, so, uh, again, just want to thank everyone again. I can't say it enough, but I look forward to posting again next week, Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Take care.